Thank you, Father. Nothing is impossible. We faint not at the trials of life that we face. We don't look at the problem. We look to our faithful God. We thank you that, Father, you are well able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. They say this mountain can't be moved They say these chains will never break But they don't know you like we do There is power in your name We've heard that there is no way through will never change they haven't seen what you can do there is power in your name so much power in your name move the unmovable break the unbreakable God we Yeah, yeah.
you, Father. The battle has already been won. All we have to do is believe for it. It's you that deserves the glory and all the honor, Father, for what you've done through your son, giving us life here and eternal life after. We thank you, Father, for all that you want to do, for it is your desire to meet our needs. Yes, you deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, I lift my hands in worship as I pray your holy name.
Can you lift your hands up to him? Because he is worthy of all the honor, all the praise, all of the glory. Without him, you and I are nothing. Doesn't mean that we don't exist, but we are way better with him than without him. Father, we do worship and give you all the praise and all the glory. Father, anything that we do out of our own self, out of our own will, the day of judgment, it'll just be burned up like sticks, like hay. But Father, anything that we do, Lord, that you've called us to do and anointed us to do, Lord, it'll pass the test because it wasn't our will, it wasn't our plan. It was your plan and your will. And Father, we just give you all the praise and all the glory. Thank you, Father God, for today. Lord, you made this day, and you told us to rejoice and be glad in this day. So, Father, we're determined to become not just hearers of the word, but also doers of it. Thanking and praising you, Father God. You've got us here safely, and Lord, we're expecting to go home safely. Thank you, Father God. You're our protector, our provider, our deliverer, our healer. Thank you, Father, for giving us the written word. Thank you, Father, for giving us the Holy Ghost to teach us so that we can know all this word as we feed upon it, Lord, as we take it into our lives, as we become doers of it. The Father, we'll be careful, Lord, that any accolades, any accomplishments, Lord, that we would have because of being doers of the word, we'll make sure that we give you all the praise all the glory and all the honor. Thank you, Father, once again for what you have done. Lord, what you will be doing. And Father, what you're giving us always, every day, we give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name, amen and amen. Turn around and tell somebody, don't forget, God is good to you and I all the time. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. I want to remind you again to sign up on the back there at the table back there concerning the Christmas banquet, January the 19th. That will be at 6 p.m. We always have a good time. This is the first Sunday of 2024, and I can tell you, you got perfect attendance. Hallelujah. Glory to God. All right. Open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Anytime you make changes, sometimes people look at you, but change is good. It means growth. And we like growth, and God likes growth, and he tells us to have fruit and to bear more fruit and to bear much fruit. So God likes it when we're bearing more and bearing much fruit. Notice, if you would, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Open your Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 2. And we'll skip right down to verse 19, where Paul's been talking to Timothy because Timothy's pastoring the church at Ephesus, and yet many people consider the church at Ephesus to be a fairly mature church, a fairly mature church. But if you go back and you study, once again, all these letters were written by the Holy Ghost from the Father to give to Paul and to, to uh, Peter and the other Timothy, to them to encourage them, and sometimes there had to be correction. Sometimes it had to call out sin that's in the camp, and we have to be able to get rid of the sin. How many think Jesus is coming back very, very soon? Glory to God. I believe he's coming back, and of course, he's coming back not for a body that's weak, depleted, and, dep and, and defeated, and disease, no, he's coming back for a church, a glorious church that's walking in victory. And, of course, the body of Christ, that's you and I. That's what he's coming back looking. And he wants us to be in good shape when he comes back. Notice in verse 19, he said, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. And, of course, that's in conjunction with verse 17 and verse 18, how people are preaching and teaching. And he calls their names out and says the things that they were teaching. Uh, that was wrong doctrine, wrong teaching. You know, just because somebody says it sounds religious, sounds biblical, you've got to go back and find out if that's really what it says. And if that's what it says, you need to find out the context of it with which it was said to make sure it fits the setting. And he said, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one, of course, he's talking about those that are his, those that claim to be Christians, and let everyone or every Christian that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Everybody say it, depart from iniquity. Now go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and of course, I don't know if you know this or not, but when the Bible was written down, originally it was not written down 
in chapters. It's a letter. And of course, when, they, when God inspired men to put the Bible together, they began to use chapters and verses for reference sake. And so, we're, well, actually, if you go back and read chapter 5, you'll find out in the Corinthian church that there's fornication. And the church of Corinth, they thought it was no big deal. Now, I don't think everybody did, but I guess the consensus was it was like it wasn't any big deal. And remember, fornication is sin, and we should be judging ourselves. It's very, very important because the Bible tells us that those that do that will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, that, that's a little different, you know, twist from people's their thinking, but you have to be careful because God's looking for purity. Everybody say it. God's looking for purity. And they wouldn't judge it, so the Holy Ghost spoke to Paul, revealed it to Paul, who was not at the church at that time, wrote the letter to them, and he judged it, and he told them what they should do as Christians. Now, what he said to do, we're going to read in just a little bit. It won't be popular. It'll hurt your feelings. It'll hurt your doctrine. It'll put questions in your mind. And that only means that you thought wrong about sin in the camp. We shouldn't tolerate sin. We shouldn't actually be enabling people to sin. We should be helping people or encouraging people to walk in life and walk in holiness because it's our nature. But notice if you would in verse, let's actually go back to chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, if you read the first eight verses prior to that, he's talking about Paul judging the boy who is having a fornication affair with his stepmother. And apparently a lot in the church knew about it. Nobody was saying anything to him or to her, and it doesn't really say one apparently was saved, a Christian, and one wasn't saved. And of course, sinners sin. Everybody say sinners sin. It's kind of their nature. But for you and I as the people of God, it's not our nature. That's why God said to confess it. In other words, you have to say, you have to acknowledge, I missed it. Well, some people won't do that. And so if you don't do that, then your sins can't be forgiven. That's why 1 John 1, 9, he said, if we confess, that means you have to say, God, I missed it. Everybody say it, God, I missed it. And of course, probably all of us have been in that room at some point in time where we missed it. But notice what he said in verse 9. And he said, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. In other words, he said, you shouldn't be fellowshipping with fornicators or people practicing sexual sins. Now, see, that kind of already changes some people's attitudes because you have to understand this, and we'll look in just a little bit, because if you run around with people of sin, one of two things is going to happen. They're going to think that you're running around with them that it's okay because you're a Christian. Are you with me? I remember talking to my daughter and about dating. And, and, I, and I told her, I said, I didn't talk to the boys. So I talked to the boys a little bit, but I talked to her. And, and I said, you understand that you're a Christian woman. And I said, you have to be careful, the people that you run around with, the conversations you have, because people who are not right with God will use you to have, and they'll invite you to tag along with them in the sin or the activities that they're about to do that they know is not right, but they'll use you as an enabler so they don't feel so bad and say, well, so-and-so was there, so it must have been okay. And so we have to be careful being around people that practice sin. We witness to them. We love on them, but we're certainly not to be involved, and it's very questionable activities. Everybody say amen. See, now we get down to the grassroots about the child of God because God told us that we're to be holy because He's holy. And if He told us to be holy, then He's expecting holiness from us. Well, I just don't know if I can do that. Well, get saved. Get the nature of God on the inside of you. Stop yielding to your flesh. Now, keep your finger there, because we're going to come right back to it. And we're talking about departing from iniquity or departing from sin. But notice something, a scripture that we use all the time for healing. But actually, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, actually, really just about covers the whole man. 
It's not just about physical, it's about, about the sin problem. But notice what 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20 says. First Peter, actually, 1 Peter 2, verse 24. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. If you have it, say, I got it. Notice, and we know what the last part of verse 24 says. By whose stripes ye were what church? Healed. So according to the Word of God, healing is already mine. You've heard me say this as you come on Wednesday nights. We've been preaching and teaching this for years, really. You don't have to ask God to heal you. In the mind of God, if you've got the revelation that He's already healed you, you can just reach out by faith and grab a hold of it and accept it and take it and thank Him for it. It's like me going to my parents' house. I don't ask them for any of the food that's there. It's already mine. It's my inheritance. I just walk in, open the door up. You know, what I will say one, you know, a couple times is, hey, do you have this or do you not have that? But it's mine. Now, I didn't earn it. I didn't pay for it. But it's mine because of who I'm associated with. And all the promises of God. Everybody say it. All the promises of God are what? Yes and what? Amen. What does amen mean? So be it. Everybody say, so be it. So when, when we come to God and say, Father, I thank you. I need healing from my body. I reach out by faith and take a hold of it. Thank you, Father, for it. See, you have to realize you didn't earn it. He gave it to you, and it, it certainly would be a good thing to be thankful for it. I'm thinking of the ten lepers. Ten got healed, but only one came back, and he began to worship Jesus at his feet. And Jesus said, where are the other nine? In other words, why aren't the other nine? You know, sometimes people will use God, get what they want, and, and never show up again to the things of God. The problem with that is you'll begin to look at that. If you go right back into sin after God ministered to you, you're probably, not, you're probably going to lose what God gave you. Not because God took it from you, because you don't know how to keep hold of it. The enemy will steal it from you. But now notice here in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, if you have it, say, I got it. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Now notice this next part, because Jesus bore our sins on his body. Notice, because he took care of the sin problem. Notice it said that we, everybody say we. Notice not just them, but we. That we being dead to what church? Dead to sins. Everybody say, I'm dead to sins. Now, one th the way you can look at it was when you accepted Christ, all your sins have been washed away and remitted and forgiven. Another way to look at it is when sins have been washed away, you become born again. It's not your nature to go out and sin. You should be dead to sin. Say it with me. Dead to sin. Actually, it says dead to sins. Now notice, and it goes on to tell us, we should live unto righteousness. Of course, if you're dead unto sins, you're going to live in righteousness. If you're not practicing sin, you're going to walk in righteousness. You're going to live righteous life. And it said by this, and here comes the physical man, by whose stripes ye were healed. Everybody say it, by whose stripes I was healed. So I, according to the Word of God, my spirit man is dead to sin. Sin doesn't have dominion over me. Colossians says that. God totally took me out of the kingdom of darkness and put me into the kingdom of light. If you're a born-again child of God, you're in the kingdom of God, you're in light. Sin is not what you practice. If you miss it, you get into the flesh and you quickly repent. But it's not your nature. Say it with me. I am dead to sin. Say it again. I am dead to sin. Don't allow yourself to make excuses for that. Be quick to repent and say, wait a minute, I'm going against my nature. Notice in verse chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he said in verse 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, and he said, I wrote unto you in an epistle, or which means a letter, not to company with fornicators, yet, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world. Now he's saying, now listen very closely, verse 10 he's talking about the world. And verse 11 he's talking about the church. Yet you really can't find the action of what's going on in the church versus the world. 
And that's not a good report. That's an unholy report. And Paul, when he says in verse 10 not to have fellowship, or it sounds like verse 10 he's given permission, and then he, in verse 11 he's not. Verse, uh, verse 10 he's talking about the fornicators and other people. He said you have to be around them to witness to them. See, what we've done in the church sometimes is we've separated ourselves so we, we don't give ourselves the ability to go witness to people. We don't fellowship with the sin, but we have to witness. Everybody say, we got to witness. If you don't tell them, then they won't hear it. If they don't hear it, then they won't know it. If they don't know it, they can't believe it. If they can't believe it, then they can't get saved. We have to tell them. But in the church, we shouldn't give permission to say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's okay. That's not what Paul said, and that's not what the Holy Ghost said. Notice he went on to say in verse 10, Yet not, he said, not to have company. He said, now, I don't want you to be having fellowship with fornicators. Yet ought not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or of the covetous, or extortioners, or of adulterers. For those must be needs go out to the world. You have to preach to them so they can get set free from that. But now notice he said in verse 11, But now I have written unto you not to keep company. Keep company what? With those in the church that are practicing sin. And he said, if any man that is called a brother. So see, he's very specific in verse 11. Verse 10, he says the world. Verse 11 is the brother. person that says he's a Christian. Be a fornicator. Now imagine this now. Think about this, what he's telling them. This is what was going on in the church at Corinth. A fornicator, a covetous, or an idolater, or a railer. Or a drunkard. Somebody must have been preaching to them, telling them it was okay for Christians to go out and do sipping saints. Go out and drinking. By the way, people still say that same thing today. Oh, it's all right. We're not drinking to get drunk. We're just drinking. I said, yeah, tell me why you are drinking. Because what are you going to do if you cause somebody who is a child of God, a baby Christian, they start drinking, they can't handle it, and the next thing you know, they're drinking and they're getting drunk and they're an alcoholic. And when you stand on Judgment Day, God's going to look down on you and go, you enable them to do that. Granted, everybody has their choice, but how many know? We don't want to encourage people to get into sin. We want to help people get out of it and live closer to God. And so, see, we don't like to hear these things in the church because it confronts the reality. Because, see, the Holy Ghost, about a month ago, he kept reminding me about telling people at the end of the service or at some point in time not being a lukewarm Christian. See, if you're going to be a lukewarm Christian, you're going to make way for the flesh. You're going to slip out in the flesh, and then you're going to come back, and you're going to use the grace of God, the mercy of God, to say, well, God will forgive me. That's not a reason to go out and sin. It's never going to be good for you if you habitually go out and intentionally sin and then come back and repent. Now, I want you to do a study today, and I want you to go back, because the Old Testament are types and shadows or examples for us. There are actually times in the Bible where the people of Israel, after habitual time and time again disobeying God, there were times actually where God came out, God uh, they, start, they came back to God, and they wanted to repent. They wanted to make things right. And God said, no, live with your choice. Now, look it up. That's in the Bible. We just assume God forgives us, but you have to be careful going out. I call it greasy grace or loose mercy. You want to live a tight life close to God. You don't want to live a life like Samson did. Samson knew he was anointed. Samson knew he had done great deeds for God. Samson knew, obviously, about the plan of God, but he decided that he would go and he would be with a lady who was not in covenant with God, called Delilah. They were not supposed to marry out of the Jewish nation. Delilah is not a Jew. We think, well, that's the old covenant. Well, wait a minute. 
Paul said the same thing in writing about marriage, about not being unequally yoked together. He said, if you're going to marry, let it be two people who are born again. Same thing. Everybody say it, same thing. God hadn't changed his mind. But Samson thought, because he's got this great power from God, because he separated himself and God could use him, that he could go out and kind of play with sin. And sin eventually, not immediately, but eventually cost him. Now, he did get his anointing back, never got his sight back. And I don't believe that it was the will of God for him to die that way. But he put himself in that situation. Sin has a price tag. Say that with me. Sin has a price tag. And by the way, the world's not always going to judge you and I by whether we do right or wrong, except it's in worldly laws. There are laws that God has for us in His Word that we might not go to jail for in this natural world, but as far as God's concerned, if I'm disobeying them, then I'm, I'm in sin, and I can't, you know, once again, people can't prove it, but if I know God told me to do something and I don't do it, I'm disobedient, and if I'm disobedient, I'm in sin. For instance, going to church. Everybody say, going to church. Is it scriptural from the Word of God? Did God tell us to go to church? Did Jesus go to church? Jesus went to church habitually over and over and over again. The Bible says, as it was his custom. And he was involved with the services be prior before he went to the ministry. So we can't say that Jesus didn't. He's our example. He went to church. And yet, how many times do you have people, they have a boatload of excuse, uh, excuses why they don't go to church? I remember, it's been years ago, I haven't looked for years, but I remember years ago, probably shortly after I became pastor, um, I called the local newspaper of Fulton County, which it used to just come out one week. Is that still what it, the publication is? One week? Is that what it is? Just one week? Did you ever, have you ever noticed all the churches in Fulton County? Go back and look at all the churches. I don't know how many churches, but I mean, there is a pile of churches. And you can say whatever you want to about this church, about that church, about this church, but I'm here to tell you, one of them churches ought to be able to fit you. There's no excuse for not going to church. People just have reasons and excuses that are not going to hold up. Everybody say, oh me. Notice in verse 11, but now I've written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, covetous, idolater, or railer, or drunkard, or extortioner, with such and one not to eat. In other words, don't go out and fellowship with them. Now, see, that, doesn't, that challenges the way we think about I'm just trying to help them. If you're already struggling with your relationship with God, you're not going to help them. They're probably going to pull you down. And you and I should look at Sin, like I don't want to get close to that thing. I don't want to see it. I don't want to touch it. I, don't, I just don't want to be around it. That doesn't mean we're not to teach and preach. And, to, and you know, For extortioners and people in the world that are like that, we want them to come out of that, but we have to tell them. But in the church, now think about this. This is what's going on in the church, that the Holy Ghost has to call these things out to the Corinthian church. You know, I've had people say, I want to be like the Corinthian church because, you know, they got the gifts of the Spirit. Yeah, they'd have the gifts of the Spirit in their services and then go out and act like carnal Christians the other six days. See, I believe God wants us to have holiness and power. Not just have power for a couple hours and then go out and live in the world. Why? You're ruining your testimony to anybody that came into that church from the world by the way you live outside. That's why the world calls the church hypocrites. Because it's not computing what they see and hear outside the church, and yet we're still going to church. Now, I always tell people, and you think you're going to get better staying away from church? That's not how it works either. You need to go to church. Everybody say, you need to go to church. But notice what he's talking about here now. Go all the way to chapter 6. Chapter 6, he said, verse 9, chapter 6, verse 9, he said, know ye not, in other words, don't you know this? That the unrighteous, everybody say unrighteous, that the unrighteous shall not 
inherit the kingdom. He's asking the question, don't you know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? You would be surprised how many people think that everybody goes to heaven. A lot of people. There are people that get up, ministers, preachers, and they get up and they tell their congregation that everybody goes to heaven. Let me turn that around. Everybody can go to heaven. But everybody doesn't go if they're not born again. And then you have some people say, well, I, I believe in God, so does the devil. The devil believes in Jesus. He knows Jesus is real. He knows God's real. Why? He lived with him. But that doesn't mean he's going to get back in good fellowship with God. We have to be careful with our relationships. We need to make sure that we stay away from them. He said, know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? In other words, don't you know that? Everybody say, I know that. Point to somebody and say, I know that. So it's very, now, we're not being judgmental. We're not being critical. We're not being snooty. And listen, we, we don't want to be snobbish with people. We need to love on people, but we have to be careful because, listen, people will use you who are determined to live a righteous life and walk in life. They will use you and your presence to see if they can do things and get away with it, and they'll use you to say, well, they were there, and they didn't say anything to me. And the world will operate that way. I told my daughter when she was dating, I said, you have to understand this. I said, in the mind of the world, in the mind of boys, you're a trophy. That's right. She's going, I am a trophy. Hallelujah. And Donnie's going, yes, amen. People will use you because you're living right with God to try to have you come and do things with them. And they'll use you and your presence, and if you don't speak up and say, I'm giving you permission, that's how they look at it. We've been in situations, my wife and I, at parties, and everything was going okay. We thought everything was going okay, and all of a sudden the alcohol came out. What did we do? Well, we didn't go up and start teaching and preaching to people. We just got up and we shook hands to the people that invited us there. Thank you for coming and we just went and left. Why? Because I know how people are. Well, the preacher was here. He didn't say anything about drink. See, you're an enabler if you stay around with that. You're, you're, you're giving them the impression it's okay. Now, the Bible says the word to abstain from even the appearance of evil. In other words, something looks evil, just like, I don't know, I just don't think so. I've shared my, my story with you, and once again, what you do is between you and God. But I know the one time I had discovered, I don't know from who, somebody gave me an IBC root beer, it comes in a brown bottle, looks like a brown bottle, it looks like a beer bottle, and I liked it, and I went to a restaurant, and they had IBC. And it said IBC, Rupert. I knew what I was getting, and I never thought about it. And here I am at this public restaurant, and that bottle was set in front of me, and all of a sudden, I mean, it was just like, just like this conviction came over me, and I realized, and I just felt the impression on the inside, hope nobody knows you're a preacher. And I thought, oh, Lord, you're right. I hope nobody knows I'm a preacher. Because, see, if I don't turn the label around and get up and say, this is just root beer, it's not a beer. See, people are going to look at that from a distance, from an appearance, and think that I'm drinking. I remember being, being at a situation one time where the event closed with the minister getting up and praying. It wasn't a church service. It was another type of service. But they had a minister come up and give the closing prayer. And... and he closed his prayer, he walked down the aisle, and he left, and he was outside as everybody's dispersing. He's out there in front of everybody smoking a cigarette. And I'm like, well, you just ruined everything. Why didn't you go back to the car and smoke your cigarette instead of doing that in front of everybody? You just told on yourself. 
well, is smoking cigarettes going to send us to hell? No. But you might have to believe God for healing at some point in time because it is a proven fact, even from the general medical uh, society, that it does cause cancer. Everybody say amen. See, you've got one body. You're going to have to take care of it. Not abuse it. Take care of it. Everybody say, I'm going to take care of mine. Now notice what he said. Verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous, in other words, he's asking, you mean you don't know this? Well, when you're in carnality, you're not thinking about that. You're thinking, oh, I can get away with this and do it. Listen, God is long-suffering. God is merciful. He'll let you do things for a long period of time, hoping you'll come to yourself like the prodigal son, eventually judge yourself, make the corrections, repent, and get things right with God. But sooner or later, if you don't, you might have to do like what Paul did with this young man and be turned over to Satan for the destruction of flesh. Notice he wasn't turned over to God. He was turned over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his soul might be saved. In other words, what he was saying was, I'd rather this man die prematurely than keep walking in sin and lose eternal salvation. That's how serious sin is. Say it with me. Sin has a price tag on it. And it goes on. He said, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. In other words, don't be thinking contrary to that. Don't, don't let yourself be deceived in thinking different. And he goes on to list this list. He, he lists in verse 10 for the world, and it's even happening in the church. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves. By the way, if you look up the word effeminate, it does refer to and make reference to homosexuality. I know some people, well, I love God. Well, you can love God, but you're going to have to depart from sin. Say it with me, depart from sin. Because he said those that do that kinds of activity are not going to heaven. Once again, we go back to the Old Testament. We find types and shadows. God said he hated it. He didn't just say he doesn't like it. He says he hates it. Why? Because it's going against natural tendencies. And he goes on, and they're abusing the Bible. The Scripture actually says in the, in the First Corinthians that they're abusing their bodies. But he goes on, he said, nor feminine, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, which is also referring to homosexuality, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Notice he said, that's the way some of you were, but you're not. See, when you got born again, you have a whole new nature. Old things, old things are what? Come on, everybody shout it, passed away. Come on, everybody say it. My old man, my old nature is passed away. Notice and it says, and all things are what? New. Everybody say become new. When you got saved, you got a brand new life. Your lease got on death penalty, got erased, got wiped away. Now you're into life and life more abundantly. But see, you have to walk in that. Oh, the devil will bring up your past. The devil will bring up past mistakes. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. I'm not bound by sin anymore. I'm walking in righteousness. And he said, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drinkers, in other words, verse, verse 10, shall inherit the kingdom of God for such of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified. Everybody say it. I've been washed in the blood. Come on, say it again. I've been washed in the blood. Notice it said you are sanctified. See, when, when you accepted Christ, he washed you of all your sins, gave you a brand new creature, and the word sanctified here means that he separated you for his plans and for his purposes. Sanctification is in, is in, is in everybody this morning. To live a separate life. Now, I live a separate life doesn't mean that you live over in, in, your, in your own little world. It just simply means you don't get involved with worldly things as far as sin activity. You have to live within those people of the world, but you let your light shine. You don't get involved. You don't live the way they do. They walk according to the flesh. You walk by faith. They're in darkness. You're in light. They have no salt. You have salt. 
They have an anointing, but it's from the guy that was kicked out of heaven. We've got an anointing from God that all things are possible. But we have to use our faith. Everybody say it, got to use my faith. So remember, when you got saved, you went over into God's kingdom. You're in God's kingdom. This is your rule book now, how you govern your life. You're not under the rules of this world. You're under the rules of God's law. Everybody say it. God's word is law of the universe. Well, pastor, what do we do about taxes? Jesus talked about taxes. He said, render under Caesar. What is Caesar? He talked about going to work. Everybody say it, going to work. He tells us a lot of things that the world does, but our character should be totally different. Our attitude should be totally different. And he said, such were some of you, but you are washed. You are sanctified. See, God separated you for his plans and for his purposes. But you are justified. Everybody say justified. But you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Aren't you glad for that? Now, go, if you would, please, go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and look at some of these words that the New Testament tells the believer that is just going to kind of rock our whole thinking and excuses that we have to get rid of so we can depart from iniquity, or when iniquity comes and challenges us and wants us to do and go, no, I'm dead to that. Say it with me. I am dead to that. Say it again. I'm dead to that. In other words, that means, now, that doesn't mean you can't be tempted. You're going to be tempted. But as far as your nature on the inside, you're dead to it. That temptation is not coming from the inside. That temptation coming to you is on your flesh or your mind. Those are the two elements of you that are not born again. Your spirit's born again. We have to learn to listen within rather than pay attention on the outside. Notice in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, once again, this is written to believers. Let's start in verse 16. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. He said to the church of Thessalonica, rejoice evermore. Everybody say rejoice evermore. Can you rejoice all the time? I mean, people are going to look at you. I shared with you last Sunday, you know, I had a Sunday school teacher always smiling. He rubbed my fur the wrong way. My fur needed to be rubbed. Why do you want to live in depression and doubt and sad and half mad? Barely ever get happy. Hardly never glad. Straight face. Not enjoying anything. See, when the Word comes and attacks the way you live, you're probably going to have to change because God's not going to change. Well, that's not, that's not how I see it. Of course you don't see it because you don't want to conform to the Word. You want to conform to your lifestyle. By the way, when you ask Jesus into your life, it's not about you asking him to come along with your plan. It's about him telling you to come with his plan. You're not yourself anymore. He bought you. He paid for you. And he expects you to follow him, not ask him to follow you. Remember when Jesus came to all 12 disciples? He didn't walk up and go, hey, guys, can I help you out? No, he said, follow me. Well, just think if they didn't follow him, what they were missing. They were missing a world of excitement. They were close. They were the inner circle. The Bible actually calls outside of Judas, but those other 11, the Bible actually calls them the apostles of the Lamb. They had a relationship that would probably be like none from the human being side, even greater than Paul, because they lived with Jesus. They ate with him. They slept in rooms together. They fellowshiped, teachings. See, all these teachings that we read, we think this is all Jesus taught. No, that's all that the Bible records to give us. What he taught them, obviously, was in line with this. This is enough information to get us through this life to walk in victory and walk in holiness. And you can do it. Everybody say, I can do it. Now, he said, rejoice evermore. Now, see, that'll rub some people's fur the wrong way because... I just don't see all that excitement. What, what's the big deal? Well, because nobody's going to win over everybody straight lace in the poker face all the time. But joy will attract people. They'll go, why are you smiling? You ever, you ever choose somebody out and they start smiling? They go, why are you smiling? I got inside information. I'm going to do what God said do. Notice what else he said. 
Rejoice evermore, verse 17. Pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean pray 24 hours a day. That just simply means you have a continual, ongoing, routine, regular prayer life with the Father God. You don't have gaps where you don't pray for two or three weeks at a time. And he said, in everything, give thanks. How much are we to give thanks for? Everybody say it, in everything. Now notice, it doesn't say for everything. Underline that word in. One word, one word can change the whole meaning. See, some people, when they read that, they go, well, why am I supposed to give him thanks for this situation? That No, it says in it. That means there are going to be things that are not going to be joyful, that are not going to be pleasant, that are not going to be very exciting, that your flesh is going to have a hard time. You're not going to see any reason to give thanks. But while you're in the midst of that, begin to thank God. Why? If I begin to thank God and magnify God, I'm calling on God to come in and intervene on this situation. But if I complain, God will stay back. But if I thank Him, I'm inviting Him. Remember, God inhabits the praises. The word inhabit means to come and dwell. God inhabits. He'll come and dwell and move with people that are thanking Him and praising Him. It doesn't say if you're begging, pleading, and bawling, and squawing, and murmuring, and complaining. No, if you're thanking Him. Thanking Him. Everybody say, thanking Him. See, when you pray, after you pray, the Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, read verses 6, 7, 8, and 9. The Bible says when you pray, at the very end of it, you ought to be thanking Him. Why are we thanking Him? Nothing's been answered yet. You're thanking Him because you believe you prayed according to what He said, and you believe He heard you, and God is on the rescue. Everybody say it. God's on the rescue. But see, listen, you undo your prayers by complaining afterwards. Or if you say something contrary to what you just prayed, you've just undone what you asked God to do. Because see, a few minutes earlier, by the words of your mouth, you asked Him to intervene. Now you're saying He never does anything. And God will go, okay, if that's the way you feel about it, I'll back up. We have to be consistent and hold fast our confession and our profession of what we believe. He said, in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the Spirit. In other words, if the Spirit of God is moving, don't you be the ice block. Don't you be the one putting cold water. You know, you can affect somebody by your attitude and the way you worship by people around you, because I guarantee you, people are watching you. Those of you in the back are watching you. But the good part of it is, everybody in front of us, we have the opportunity to raise our hands and praise God and thank God. Because, see, there are people that are going through things just like you and I, and they're watching to find out, are you going to praise God or not? Are you going to thank God or not? Don't be the stumbling block. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the Spirit. Despise not prophesying. Prove all things. Hold fast. To that which is good, now notice in verse 22, if you don't have it underlined in your Bible, here's a good time to underline this in your Bible. Verse 22, this is written to believers. Abstain from all appearance. Everybody say appearance. Notice it didn't say that it's actually an act of sin or evil. If it just looks wrong, if it just, anybody ever be around a situation and you, and all of a sudden you're standing there and you're listening and people's talking and you just sense like it's about to get escalated and go ugly and bad. That's your chance to get out. Say it with me. That's my chance to get out. I've been in situations like that. <laughs> Actually, several years ago, I was assistant pastor. Uh, myself and the pastor at that time, we actually, there was, a, there was a fight that broke out actually uh, when we parked in the front by, by, uh, by a man that would attend church periodically. And I was talking to him. The pastor was talking. To him. I think there was a couple of other men. And man, the next thing I knew, the guy that we were talking to, he got wild and crazy. And so we had to jump on him and just kind of calm him down to get him. But he was ready to fight. Well, he was fighting. But four or five of us, we were like, whoo. And I'm thinking, man, this doesn't look good. This doesn't look good. People going up and down 522, and here four or five of us, you know, we, we got this man. You know, How many of you understand this? Appearances, people judge appearances. They might not think. 
They might not understand what's going on, but they'll look at it and go, oh, man, them people are crazy there. Look at that. They got, they're beating a the man up. Man, I ain't going to that church. I remember hearing a story one time. See, things are not always as they appear. I remember a story one time. This man, he was actually sleeping in his bed, and he was a single man. And he knew when he went to bed that night that nobody was in his bed. He said, however, my wife knows the story. He said, however, he said, during the middle of the night, he said, I woke up. And he said, when I did, he said, my right hand was touching this arm and this hand. And he said, I'm like, oh, Lord, somebody got in my bed. Who in the world got in my bed? And he said, I'm touching this arm going, is that a real human being? What in the world? He said, all of a sudden, I, I got to get ready to fight. He said, I jumped up and was ready to fight. And he said, there was nobody on the other side. Here, what happened? He was sleeping on that arm and fell asleep. So when, when he was touching it, he couldn't feel himself touching himself. So he thought somebody was in his bed. And he said, you talk about feeling stupid. But listen, you can't look at things and just think, oh, I know what's going on there. Appearances. Everybody say appearances. See, people are watching. Their appearances so... Listen, I, and you've heard me say this. It's been probably years I've said it, but I'll say it again. If you're going to have a carnal fit, everybody know what I'm talking about? If you're going to go and rant and rave, if you have a basement, go to your basement. Close all the doors, close all the windows, and have your fit or your carnal moment. Because if you do it outside in public, they'll watch you and they'll remember you. And one incident of being in the flesh, it will destroy years of you testifying to people. And trust me, that person, they can hardly wait to go tell what they saw from that holy woman or man of God. Appearances. Be careful. They're not worth it. I know I've told the story, and, and I felt bad for this individual after you hear more of the story, but when we were at Rama, all students, uh, they have a parking sticker, and it's just for a one-year parking sticker that it gives you permission to park in the Rama parking lot because students need a certain amount of parking. And, and, they, and they told us the story, and I thought, well, I never thought about this stuff. And they told the story of an individual who was a first-year student. He's trying to do right. And this student was at a mall, and in the mall was a, little, uh, was a little place that it was a bar. And he said, I went there on the, on the weekend, and he said it was jam full. And he said there was, there was one parking place, and he said, I rode around for a long time. And he said, finally, there was one place open, and he said, don't you know, it was right in front of the bar. He said, I didn't think anything about my parking ticket or my parking sticker. After all, I'm not going in there, I'm just... Went down to some other stores, and he said, the next day they got a call at Rama that they saw a Rama student parked in front of the bar. They called the individual in. Now, they're telling us this story, and I'm thinking, well, he wasn't at the bar. Technically, he didn't do anything wrong, but see, people don't know that. People know what they see. And they'll make a judgment based on what they see. They don't know all the details. They only know what they think. I, I heard a minister one time say, he said, presumption to many is greater than the truth. Let that sink into you. Presumption to many is greater than truth. Because they presume what they see. Or they presume what they hear. And they make it their truth. Appearances are very, people are watching you. Uh, I, don't, I don't think people are watching you. Oh, yes, they are. Parents, if you've got kids, they're watching you. My wife and I, we're just, we're just hearing stories now, which are, which are funny. Uh, and I didn't even know this, but just this past week, uh, my wife, she was making cookies. Uh, what was the ones? The, well, not the snowflakes. The cornflakes? The cornflakes cookies? Is that right? Uh, and what was the other ones? 
the, the no-bake cookies. And, and I, I didn't know this. And, but see, this is the perception of your, of your kids. Now, Cam's 30, Chelsea's 33, K, Casey's 28. And so Cam said he wanted these cookies. And, and we just liked them because they were good. And here's Cameron's response when he said, can you make them? And Jenny goes, yes, I can make them. He said, oh, yeah. He said, now listen, listen. He said, oh, yeah, I want them cookies. Those are the cookies that poor people eat. His perception, but see, they didn't know. They didn't know the things were tight for her and I. We didn't, we didn't try to say, oh, man, tight, money's tight. No, we just managed it. We did what we could do. But now they look back and they go, now my son calls them poor people's cookies. And I'm like, son, what? you like them, what does it matter? And, of course, then they found out after the years they've grown up that the reason that she made those, I don't, what, you, that's just something you made up, wasn't it? Or did you have a recipe? Did you find a recipe? She found a recipe, but she said, you know, instead of me going out buying all these other stuff for the other cookies, we just whipped something up that we had at the house, and the kids loved it. But see, their perception of people, how they look and view you. I remember Smith Wigglesworth. He would go out and minister to people, and he said, and this came from Lester Summerall, Smith Wigglesworth, when he was out doing the work of God, he always dressed up. Once he was doing, done doing what God told him to do, then if he would go out into the cities and he would dress casual, he would always, he said, why would I dress different? I'm doing the work of God. I'm giving God my best. And see, I could see that because people are watching us. They're watching to see, are we going to conform because the world does it? Or are we going to do it because God told us to do it? See, you've got to be careful about fads. Uh, Scotty, are you, you're about my age, aren't you? You're in your 60s, aren't you? Okay, and Jerry, how old are you, Jerry? Not 60s yet. Okay, he's the baby. But we can remember, Donnie and Jeannie, we can remember the hippie era. Uh, huh? I didn't call anybody old, did I, Donnie? I did not. I just said, we can remember. Now you're really told on yourself, you do remember. We can, we can remember bell bottoms, hip huggers, uh, puka shells. We can remember uh, Brill Cream. And do you remember Brill Cream, Donnie? Little Dabble, do you? Do you remember that, Vance? Some of this stuff? Yeah, absolutely. We, and, you know, and, some of the, and then every once in a while, you know, we'll go out and we'll see somebody that their hair, I mean, it's the color of Ronald McDonald's hair, but they'll have it spiked up. And of course, I think they call it a rooster tail or something like that. And I'm going, you people think you act like you're coming to something new. Man, we used to have in our days, we had the duck tail. See, there's nothing new under the sun with man. It just runs its cycles. And all the devil does is just change the paper. Be careful what you get involved in with the world. Don't get hooked up in a fag. Get hooked up in God. Everybody say amen. But now notice verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Verse 23. And the very God of peace. What kind of God do we serve? Come on, everybody say God of peace. God of peace, sanctify you wholly or completely. In other words, he wants you separated for him wholly and completely. Not 50%, not 90%, not 20%. You ever go buy a hamburger? I, I, I never took notice of this but just a couple years ago, maybe because I wasn't buying it. But now when you go to buy a hamburger, they have different grades. When I was a kid being raised up, it was, it was hamburger. Now you've got grades of hamburger. Now you've got 80-20. You've got 85-15. I think you've got 73-27 or whatever. And I'm thinking, man, I think we used to just go buy a hamburger. Now we've got different grades on all this stuff. Funny about the world. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray your whole spirit, say it with me, my whole spirit, how much of my spirit? Everybody say, my whole spirit. Notice Paul's praying for the whole. That your whole spirit, and I could read it this way, and your whole soul and your whole body be preserved. What, church? Blameless. Can you live a life blameless when Jesus shows up? 
He's expecting it out of us. Be preserved, blameless, unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Go to Jude chapter 1. Jude chapter 1. Jude chapter 1. Jude chapter 1. There's just one chapter. Jude chapter 1. Now notice, verse 17 in Jude, verse 17 says about keeping yourself in the love of God. And he said in verse 18, mockers will come in the last time. There's going to be people that are going to make fun of you and I if we're determined to live right with God, live a holy life before God. Don't want to be involved in certain things. We want to keep a proper appearance with people. And that means, you know, you might have to say, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, I, I made up my mind from that day forward. You know, the IBC root beer, I'm just not going to order that thing. Matter of fact, I don't even have it at my house. Because I know if I have somebody that's an unbeliever and they come there in the house and they may not see the whole label and they see that brown bottle there, they may think, wow, the preacher's drinking. Well, see, I don't want that. Because I know they'll get out and they'll tell people. And once again, their perception will be greater than the truth. And see, once people see things and say things and get it out there, it's not coming back. They may say they're sorry, they may say they're wrong, but it's not coming back. I, I remember an individual of a lady in the church, she was, she was saying all kinds of bad things about the preacher that were wrong and inaccurate. She was telling all kinds of people in the church, or maybe it was a man, but anyhow, an individual in the church, and he got the revel they got the revelation that they were wrong, they went to the pastor, and I am so sorry, I was wrong, I should have never done that. What can I do to make it right? And the minister said, I thought this was pretty smart. He said, there's just one thing you can do. He said, what can I do? I want you to take a pillow that's full of feathers, and I want you to go to the top of the mountain, and I want you to cut that pillow open at the top of the mountain, and I want you to unload all those feathers out of that pillow. He said, that's it? Well, I want you to come back and see me then. So they did that. They came back. Pastor, they were kind of looking like, what? what in the world is the reason for this? Pastor, I did it. Is there anything else I can do for you to make this thing right? He said, yeah. And I want you to go back up. We let all those feathers out, and I want you to go pick them up. It's too late, isn't it, church? You never know how far. I remember... Uh, a course that my wife taught probably 25, 20, 25 years ago. And it talked about how far good news goes versus how far bad news goes. And they found out statistics that bad news will travel and hit more ears than good news. See, we're kind of programmed that way. And, and the reason that we're programmed, not by God, but because that's our, that's our flesh nature, which is the demonic nature. See, the devil wants to get more trash. So he wants to be an accuser. He, he wants bad news to keep going on and keep going on, and keep going on. But notice Jude. Jude, and it says, verse 20, 21. Jude, verse 21. Keeping yourself in the love of God. What do you got to keep yourself in? Come on, if I say, I got to keep myself in the love of God. Is the love of God in you today? Yeah, everybody say it with me. The Bible says, Romans chapter 5, verse 5, God's love is in me. So can you stay in the love of God? Yeah, it's going to take some faith. I have to put your feelings down. Put your emotions under. You're going to have to not do what you want to do and what the Word says do. But you can do that. Keeping yourself in the love of God. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus, which means looking for the mercy means looking for the return of Him unto, unto eternal life. And of some have compassion making a difference. In other words, some people you're going to have to witness to and minister to with the love of God. Verse 23, and others save with fear. Some people you're going to have to preach hellfire and brimstone to them. Pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. In other words, you don't want to get so close to that situation that you allow their sin to get on you. You don't want that to happen. Verse 24, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. Is God able to keep you from falling? Is God able to keep you from falling? Say that with me. God is able to keep me from falling. Say it again. God is able to keep me from falling. If you'll go back and every time you've missed it, 
got into sin, right before you did the act or spoke out of your mouth, if you would have listened down here, God would have been telling you by His Spirit, don't do it. Don't do it. That's Him keeping you. Don't let the idea of keeping you means He's going to make you. You don't lose your will. If you follow Him, you're going to be tempted, but if you follow Him, He is able to keep you from falling. You don't have to sin, but I do have to listen to God. Notice keeping power, able to keep you from falling and to present you. Present me. Who am I going to be presented to? I'm going to be presented to the Lord. Present you how, church? Faultless. Verse 24. Everybody say, God's plan is to present me faultless on judgment day. Say it again, faultless on judgment day. So you don't want to leave this earth and then get up and go, i got to repent. No, you want to be faultless when you leave here. Everybody say it, faultless. Now, go if you would, please. Go back to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Stay with me real quickly. I want to show you, I want to show you these scriptures, and it talks about being perfect and blameless and faultless. And see, sometimes we think, well, we just can't help it. Oh, yes, you can. You're just listening to your flesh. You're yielding to your thoughts. You don't have to do it. The enemy will bring up your lifestyle that you used to do before Christ or your past mistakes. Well, you did it once. You might as well just go do it again. No, not today. I'm dead unto sin. Say it again. I am dead unto sin. Say it again. I am dead unto sin. Now notice verse 17, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 17. That the man of God, what's the person here now? The man of God. Everybody say the man of God or the woman of God. See, word here means mankind. That the man of God or the woman of God. Don't you like that? Are, are you of God today? Say it with me. I'm of God. That's a good tune to it. I'm a woman of God. I'm a man of God. Feels good saying that, doesn't it? That the man of God may be what, church? Perfect. Everybody say perfect. King James says perfect. My wife's translation says complete, which it certainly means that. If you're perfect, you're going to be complete. Say it with me. That the man of God may be perfect or completely, notice, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. In other words, really what God wants is he wants a person who is a vessel of honor, which we're going to start looking at in verse 20. But remember, and God's so real with this, He said in the church there are people of honor, there are people of dishonor. What does He want from us? He wants vessels of honor. Say it with me, vessels of honor. Now, God would not tell us to do something or to walk in something we couldn't have or accomplish you're going to have to say no to your flesh and say yes to your spirit, yes to the Word. And he said, furnished unto all good works. Every child of God. This is one of the reasons why you need to come to church on a regular routine basis. Why? So you can be taught how to be able to lay hands on the sick. So you can be taught how to witness to people. So you can be taught how to teach people about tithing about how to intercede. You can tell people about using the name of Jesus. If you don't come to church and you're not hearing the Word on a routine, regular basis, you're not going to be com completely well-rounded. You're not going to walk in that perfect man because God can't use you where you have an endeavor to have teaching and be able to step out and use it. The less information you have, the less ability you can do for God. He'll use you according to your faith. Well, you can't have faith for something you haven't learned or something you haven't been taught or something you don't want to hear. But God wants us to be well-rounded. He wants us to be complete. He calls us a perfect man. Everybody say a perfect man. What does that mean? Well, if I have an individual, and if I need this individual to go talk to somebody about the baptism, I can go to this person that knows about the baptism and teach that person, and hopefully that person will respond and get filled with the Holy Ghost. Right on the other hand, there's another person that maybe were the same individual that went and taught somebody how to get filled with the Holy Ghost, 
There may be somebody there that needs healing. I can use that same person because they're perfect and complete and say, hey, I need you to go to your workplace, a different person, and talk to them about healing. But I can't be used of God if I don't know how to minister to them. That doesn't mean you're going to have to know everything. Because see, he's going to start off with what do you believe and what do you know? Sometimes we think we have to have all the answers. Well, first of all, who says they're going to ask questions? They may just say, yeah, I, I, I believe that, and just walk right in it. I've had people actually since becoming pastor that called me up, that, and the last one called up was from Baltimore. And the reason he called me was he said he couldn't find other uh, Raymond churches, and I'm like, ah, that doesn't make any sense because I know the Raymond church is down in Baltimore. But anyhow, and he said, you're the first one that answered. Maybe that was the key thing, that answered. And, and I said, well, what can I do for you? He said, well, I've been going to this church, and he said, I found out something about them talking about being saved. Can you explain that to me? So I did plain about the plan of salvation. See, you can't explain that to people and answer their questions if you don't know what the Word says. That's why he wants you to be complete and be well-rounded. And God goes, there's my perfect man. I can use him for anything. That's the way God wants every child of God in this place to be. He can use you for anything. See, the world has specialists. But God has his people well-rounded that we can go minister to anybody about anything. Come on, church. And if we don't have it and we still want to be available, then we can get a hold of the right person and bring them to them and help them. But notice it calls it the perfect man. Everybody say, perfect man. Go to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, real quickly. Romans chapter 12. I think it's interesting that the King James uses the word perfect. Because he, Well, nobody's perfect. Well, wait a minute. That's not what the Bible says. It says about being a perfect man. A well-rounded man. Hallelujah. I'm up for that. A holy man. A sanctified man. A man of God. A woman of God. Separated for the call and the plan and the purposes of God. Notice here in Romans, the 12th chapter, and verse 1 and 2. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. And notice in the King James brings out the word perfect again. You and I can know the perfect will of God. I've had people say, well, Pastor, I just don't know what God wants me to do. I said, read Mark chapter 16. What's that say? <laughs> well, that's why you don't do it. You don't know what it says. Read your Bible. This is God's will. Say this with me. The word of God is God's will speaking to me about my life, what He wants to do in my life for me, and what I can do for Him. See, this is the will of God speaking to me, what He wants me to do. If I don't read it, then I'm going to be negligent about the will of God. Now, you're a baby Christian, that's okay. You've just started you've not been saved long, that's fine. But if you're a Christian been saved 10, 15, 20 years, you should be well, you should have a pretty good idea of the direction God wants to take your life. You shouldn't be out there in the wilderness like the people of Israel just stumbling and bumbling around. That, you know what happens if you do? You're going to imitate Israel. You're going to gripe and complain. Oh, the way's too hard. Oh, this is too difficult. Well, Find out what the will of God is. Obey God. Everybody say, obey God. You ever notice Israel always got in trouble when they disobeyed God? When they obeyed God, things went great. Disobeyed God, things went bad. Some people, well, it just seemed like God's mad at him, and he's not mad at him. No, he's not. Listen, God doesn't change, church. God's not up there on an emotional roller coaster. One day he's loving you, the next day he hates you. You're the ones, we put ourselves in positions by our obedience or disobedience, of what God can do and what God can't do. And if we disobey Him, now I'm, I'm going from His light to now I'm in the darkness, and now I'm over in the devil's camp. And trust me, when the devil sees a child of God on his camp, he is going to shoot at you. Because he knows if you ever get to find out who you are in Christ, then he's got another enemy. Notice, Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your what kind of service? Reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, 
And be not conformed to this world. Say it with me. Be not conformed to this world. See, there's a lot of things that our world goes through. We talked about some of us have got a few years on us. I didn't call you old genie. Just want you to know that. Remember that so don't go out here. But we've seen fads come and go. How many remember the saddle shoes? Anybody remember the saddle shoes? Pretty sure they're not coming back. But something of that line. But we see all these fads going. They'll last for four, five, six years, and then they'll slowly fade, and then something else will fade, will come in, and then it'll be a fad, and then it'll fade away. How many of you remember hula hoops? Man, when hula hoops came around, I mean, man, it was a big seller. My wife showed a picture to me the other night. Uh, her one brother, uh, it used to be a ride, not in my air, but in her, her brother's air, youngest brother's air, called the Big Wheel. It was a three-wheeler, had two little wheels. You sat down and had a great big wheel. And how many remember? And, of course, the whole commercial was, you know, you can run this thing fast, and you pull on the brake, and you spin it around. I thought, man, those were the days. Those were the simple days. Notice, let's read on. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So you need to be transformed the way your thinking is, that you may prove or that you may know what is that good and acceptable and perfect. Everybody say perfect. And perfect will of God. Can you know for your life the perfect will of God? Can you know exactly what God wants you to do? I can tell you there was a time in my life where I would put myself in the good and the acceptable when I went to Ramah. I'm like 30 days out from graduating my second year, and I'm looking at people around me, and they're asking me, and they're telling me what they're going to do. And I'm like, I have no idea what I'm going to do. And I'm thinking, well, how, God, how am I supposed to know you will if you don't tell me? Then I am so glad one of the teachers must have been led by the Holy Ghost. And he said, there are going to be some of you here, you're not going to get any instruction whatsoever until you graduate. And I was so glad to hear that because I thought, man, there's something wrong with me. I'm not hearing God. I'm not following God. I'm not just not, you know, I'm not in touch with God. And I thought, I don't need to hear him now. I ain't finished yet. I haven't completed my course. He told me to go to Ramah and graduate. I'm close, but I haven't done it yet. I know people that went to Ramah and dropped out in their first year. I know people that went to Ramah and didn't graduate. God sent me there to graduate. So why do I need the next step if I haven't completely finished the step that he told me to? And then I remember one day, I graduated. And I don't know, she brought this advertisement or something like that. I think we kind of got together, and I think we kind of had a, because I told, I told her before she ever came out, I said, listen, I said, uh, actually when I proposed to her, I said, now here's the deal. I said, I have no idea where I'm going with God. I said, for all I know, I may end up in Africa. And of course, Africa, it was just like, she goes, I'll go. I'll go. I'm thinking, I might not want to go. But she said, I'll go wherever you go. I said, because I have no, and I didn't have a clue. All I knew was God gave me one step and I had to do that. See, sometimes we think God's going to lay out everything. You probably can't handle it. You just got to be faithful and do what God tells you to do right now. And listen, no matter what you hear other people say this or that, if God's telling you to do something, you just stay with that and be steadfast and be faithful. Everybody said, got to be faithful. Be faithful means what? You put your hand to plow, you just keep plowing. There'll be people coming, there'll be people going, there'll be people who are going to do other things, but until God tells you something different, you keep doing what you're doing. Now, if you're doing nothing, get your hand to the plow. Because, see, God doesn't give direction to a parked car. At some point in your life, you're going to have to get in the car, put it in gear, and start going forward, and he'll tell you to turn left or right. Everybody say amen. Notice, everybody say, I can know the perfect will of God. Now, go to Colossians real quickly. Colossians chapter 1. 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 Stay with me. Almost done. Colossians chapter 1. 
Colossians chapter 1. But I want you to see these perfect, 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 blameless, without fault. Notice in verse 28, Colossians 1, verse 28. Colossians 1, verse 28. Colossians 1, verse 28. Do you have it? Colossians 1, 28. Paul's talking to them. He said, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, talking about teaching them in the wisdom of God. Everything they're teaching and preaching is the wisdom of God, not the wisdom of man, but the wisdom of God. Now notice, what's the reason for that? Why do we teach and preach? Here's the goal that the Holy Ghost gave to Paul, gave to you and I, and gave to every preacher. That we may present every man or every woman, how church? Perfect in Christ Jesus. Every goal for every preacher, teaching and preaching and teaching and preaching, is to be able to do what? When you stand before Jesus, you can hear these words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. But notice he uses the word perfect, complete, wholeness, perfect, complete, wholeness. Go to Philippians chapter 3. A couple more real quickly. Philippians chapter 3, perfect. So when people start talking, well, nobody's perfect, they say, whoa, 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 whoa. Start whipping these scriptures out and say, wait a minute, you can live a blameless life. But if you miss it, you can be quick to repent. How many of you know? If you're quick to repent and God forgives you, how many of you know that sin's been washed away? It's off your record. It's not held against you. And you're back in right relationship in the things of God. Notice Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And go all the way down. Well, let's go to verse 13. Philippians 3 verse 13. He said, Brother, I count not myself to apprehended. In other words, the word apprehended here means not to arrive. In other words, I, I still need to grow more. I still have to learn more. It doesn't mean he's, he's not admitting and saying he's in sin. That just means he has more to learn, which that's something for you and I. There's always more to learn about the word. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. See, it would be very easy for Paul to go back and find out how and remember how he persecuted the church before he got saved. The devil would like to condemn him to stop him and think, man, I should have never done that. No old things are what, church? Passed away. Behold, all things are what? Become brand new. Say it with me. I am a new creature, a new creation. And who's the creation in? Christ Jesus. So who are you going to imitate? Christ Jesus. Absolutely. Those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark. For the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, let us therefore, as many as be perfect. That's interesting, isn't it? Notice what he's saying here now. He's talking to a specific group of people. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect. He's not talking to just anybody in the church. The word perfect, but once again, I want to bring up the word perfect to you. Because it's amazing how many times God will put the word perfect in there. And yet we say, Christians say, well, nobody's perfect. And really what we're doing is we're giving ourselves excuse to sin. But if you go back to the word of God, he said perfect man. Stay with me, perfect man. We just read Colossians, a perfect man. What kind of man is God looking for? Perfect man. What kind of woman is God looking for? Come on, everybody say perfect. Now, see, you ought to know this. Your heart ought to be perfect with God all the time. All the time. You don't have any room for condemnation. Walking in the light. Walking in the fellowship. Perfect, perfect fellowship with the Father. In the light. No gray areas. You're in that light and you're in that fellowship. Everybody say perfect. Anybody ever have something happen to you? You go, man, that's perfect. Couldn't happen any better. That's what I want to hear from God. Well done. Well done. Philippians. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect. Of course, the word perfect, if you translate it, it literally means mature or well-rounded or complete. Be thus minded, and if anything be otherwise minded, God shall reveal it unto them. Now, go to one scripture, if you would, please. Go to Luke, the fifth chapter. Luke, chapter 5. Last verse of scripture. Luke, chapter 5. Actually, go to John, chapter 5. 
John chapter 5. We go to Luke, but we're going to go to John. John chapter 5, last verse of Scripture. Stay with me now. I shared with you last week, Jesus talked to several people, and they weren't born again because anybody that he ministered to, as far as healing, they were all under the old covenant, and none of them were born again until after Jesus was resurrected. But I want you to notice in John, the fifth chapter, John chapter 5, John chapter 5, and notice in verse 1, John chapter 5, verse 1. Do you have it, church? John chapter 5, I'm going to read it from this little Bible. John chapter 5, and I want you to see something that Jesus is going to bring about to this man, the potency of sin and what sin can do against you. John chapter 5, verse 1. Are you there? After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there was at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. How many porches, church? Five porches. And in these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. So these were people, basically, that medicine could not cure. They were incurables. In the natural, they had no hope from the medical science arena. Incurable. But... God, in his mercy, would empower an angel that, that he sent to come down and bring him out in the waters at a season, and apparently it must not have been the same time, every time, it just says a season, that God would give that angel enough power in that water that whatever, whatever it was that was wrong with their physical body, just that one person would be healed. Everybody say, just that one would be healed. So let's read on. Verse 4. Um, actually, yeah, verse 4. And an angel, and an angel went down at the certain season into the pool and troubled the water. In other words, it moved the water. So when the people saw the water move, apparently they didn't see the angel, but apparently the water moved. When they saw the water move, because apparently this might have, must have been happening for years, and this is just the mercy of God. And then God will do that sometimes. He'll just heal people in spite of themselves. That's called the sovereignty of God. But by the way, listen, church. Listen, pay attention to me. You want to hear this? God did not call the church to live by the sovereignty of God. He called us to live by faith. Sovereign move of God means he may do it and he may not do it. But he can do it. You don't want to live like that. Because you'll be like this man, years at the pool, and if you can't get in, then you never get healed. The first of the troubling of the water stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Verse 5, and a certain man was there, which had an infirmity 30 and 8 years. Everybody say 38 years. Here's a wonderful thing. You don't have to wait 38 years to get healed from God. Because 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 says, By his stripes you were what, church? Everybody say, I was healed. Aren't you glad you don't have to wait 38 years? Are you ready for this? Aren't you glad you don't need any man to take you to go get healed? Because really, the man that he was looking for showed up. See, we got the man Christ Jesus. See, our man's Jesus. By the way, he's your elder brother. You want to look up the big brother? That's good. And he's the captain of our salvation. So we got a man. We got somebody that will justify us and we can plead our case and say, thank you, Father, for by his stripes, I'm the healed. Hallelujah. You got the man, Christ Jesus. All right, read on. And a certain man must have been there at infirmity 38 years. And when, he saw Je and when Jesus saw him and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto them, Will thou, now listen, isn't this interesting? He saw this man. He knew this man was sick. He knew he was incurable. And yet he asked the man if he wanted to be healed. I don't know about you, but that still amazes me. Why? He's looking to find out what this man is believing for. He's, God is looking to find out what are you believing for. Blind Bartimaeus, he did the same thing. I mean, remember the story, Mark chapter 10, verses 48 to around 52. Blind Bartimaeus. What, have you ever thought about it? Blind Bartimaeus couldn't see. If you're blind, you can't see. 
I want you to go back. Once again, here's your little study today. This is your second thing. Go back and find out how many times people that came to Jesus or he came to them, he told them to do things that they couldn't do in order to receive their healing. I don't know how many times he told people that were laying on cots arise. He told them to do something they couldn't. If they could have done that, they would have already done it and got up. Why, was he, why did he tell them to do that? Because they needed to believe what he said. See, faith requires some action. If you believe you're healed, then you believe you're healed. And listen, and then you're going to act like you're healed. I remember Kenneth Hagin when he got healed. He said he, got, he said he had nothing happened yet in his body. He's 16 or 17, laying there in the bed. And he said, Lord, and he prayed the prayer of faith. He found out about the prayer of faith. Urban James, he said, I prayed the prayer of faith. And he said, I thought, and now I am healed. And he said, I laid there, and nothing happened. He said, I thought, wait a minute. I'm doing everything I know to do. He said, all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost said, well, if you believe you're healed, Healed people don't stay in bed at this hour of the day. He said, I knew exactly what. Have you ever noticed when the Holy Ghost tells you something, you know exactly what he's talking about. See, he's also called the spirit of truth. He said, I knew exactly. He said, I knew I had to start acting and trying all of my best to get myself out of this bed and begin to stand. See, faith requires some action. Where's that from, preacher? Acts chapter 2 says faith without works is dead most in the church have the faith they just have no action now let's read on stay with me jesus said wilt thou be made more whole in other words do you want to be healed that's an interesting question some people don't want to be healed don't think everybody wants to be healed some people want sympathy what am i going to do if i'm there and i want to lay hands on them well you can lay hands on them, but it could be laying hands on empty heads. You need to find the people that want to get healed, want to get well, because God won't override their will. He may even want to heal them, but they don't get anything. I have a scripture reference for you. Write it down. Luke chapter 5, verse 17. Had a, relig- a minister's conference with Jesus, a jammed house full of religious people. It was so packed, a man couldn't get in on a cot. And the Bible says at the very bottom of verse 17, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Not the man on the cot, but them. None of them got healed. You know why? They didn't want to hear to be healed. God wanted to heal them. See, if God's in control of everything, uh, some of us are missing it. Let's read on. The impotent man answered and said, Sir, I have no man. But we got a man, don't we, church? Say it with me. I got a man, and his name is Jesus. He said, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him. Now the man is down. He cannot get up and rise. And what does he tell this man to do? He tells this man, if you really believe my word, you're going to act and do what I tell you to do. What does he tell him to do? Rise, take up thy bed, and what church? And walk. Why didn't the man do that prior to that? Because Jesus didn't speak to him. See, you've got to believe what the Word says. You're going to have to choose. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Now, if you know anything about the religious people, boy, they got mad doing anything on the Sabbath. But Jesus called him out at least two times in his ministry that we know of. And he said, you're hypocrites because you'll take care of your animals, but you won't take care of humanity. And he chewed him out for that. In other words, what he was saying was, how come it is you'll love your animals, and if they fall in a ditch, you'll get them out, but you won't help man that falls in a ditch. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked, and on the same day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said unto him, that was cured. it, It is the Sabbath day. Is it not lawful for thee to carry thy bed? In other words, they're saying, what are you doing carrying thy bed? They should have come up and said, man, you got healed. Woo! What happened? But religious people don't look at the same views the way you and I do. Do we have religious people today? Absolutely. The Jews therefore said unto him that that was cured. Is it not the Sabbath? And it is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed? 
But who told him to carry his bed, church? Come on, who told the man to carry his bed? Jesus. Everybody say Jesus. Now, see, if you think, well, he knew exactly who he was. Oh, listen to the story. He didn't know exactly who he was. He just believed what the man said. You know, when you don't have any hope and somebody comes to give you hope, you may just act on it. Everybody say amen. Listen now. Verse 12, verse 11. And he answered them, he that made me whole didn't even say who he was. The same said unto me, take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, what man is this that said unto thee, take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not who it was. He didn't even know who it was. But he believed what he said. Ever say, he believed what he said. See, do you believe what he said? Do you believe what this word says? See, most of you believe it concerning going to heaven, but you ought to believe it about all the promises. They're all in here for you. Use as much faith as you believe when you die you're going to go to heaven and use your faith for these other promises. No different. It's just the church has been so instructed and so much teaching about going to heaven, we haven't taught the other benefits. And then when people read the other benefits, they go, well, yeah, but you know, God may not want me to be healed. Do you have a man? You got a man. And by that man's stripes, you were what? Come on, everybody say, I was healed. And he that washed and he that was healed wist not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, the multitude being in that place. Now, we're still talking about sin, but I want you to read this whole story about sin afterward. Well, I like this man. This man got healed. There was a time where he was just totally confined to those five porches. But he got healed. Everybody say he got healed. What's the best thing to do after you get healed? To go to church or not go to church? Huh? Come on, everybody say go to church. After all, who got you healed? The power of God, right? Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him. So what did this man do after he got healed? Man, he started going to church. Say it with me. He started going to church. You know, if you want to keep what God has given you, you better get around the things of God. Because if you don't, the enemy will steal from you. Why do you think two of the seven churches in the book of Revelation, the Holy Ghost told them to hold fast to that which you have? Because, and he even mentions one time about Satan. Why? Because Satan will steal what God has given you. Now that goes against the way a lot of, I just don't understand why God healed me, then he took it away. You know, there is a scripture in the book of Job that talks about the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh. But listen, you have to take it within its context. How many of you have said things under pressure afterwards you realized I shouldn't have said that because of the pressure? How many of you have actually, under the pressure, the anger, maybe said a curse word? Anybody? I ain't admitting to nothing, preacher. That's okay. It fits. Jeannie's shaking her head. Jerry's in deep meditation. Why do we do that? Pressure. Listen. Pressure will push you to do things. Next thing you know, it comes out and you do it. And see, the enemy knows that he likes to apply pressure to people because he wants to find out how much he can put on you if you're going to adhere to him. Or if you're going to adhere to God. Don't think, listen, the Bible talks about the, the fiery trials. The fiery trials. Fiery trials. Everybody say fiery trials. Now notice. So Jesus finds this man at church. And that's a good place to be. You get healed, you ought to start going to church. Everybody say, you get healed. You get saved. Ought to start going to church. So it's a good place. He's at the right place doing the right thing at the right time. But now notice what Jesus said to him. He said, behold Thou art made whole. In other words, he said, you've been healed. Notice these next three words, because our subject is about departing from sin, and this man's not born again yet. What's the next three words, church? Everybody say it, sin no more. Come on, everybody say it, sin no more. Now notice, sin no more, or if you don't, or if you continue sinning, 
He's literally, Jesus is literally telling this man how to keep his healing. You want to keep something God has given to you? Sin no more. Don't walk in iniquity. Don't walk in transgression. Don't yield to the flesh. Say it with me, sin no more. Now notice, Jesus is very real with this man. He said, you've been healed and you're whole. Don't sin anymore. Apparently, sin must be an option, even to the unbeliever. See, sometimes we think, well, I just don't have any control. <laughs> well, then who is in control? Now, if you want to come down to that, you sure don't want to admit the devil's in control. Now you've really put yourself in a bad situation because God should be in control. Say it with me, sin no more. Notice, lest or else a worse thing shall come upon thee. Now write this scripture reverence down. Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 to like verse 47. Jesus is talking about evil spirits being cast out of a man or out of a house. The house is referring to the man. And he said that spirit will go in dry places and he's looking to come into another body. He can't find any way to get back into another house or a temple, which is our body. And so he goes back where he was kicked out. And the Bible says he found the house clean, swept, and empty. Empty's not good. You want to be filled with God. You don't want to be empty. Say it with me. I don't want to be empty. Now, it's funny because, see, the world will tell you in meditating, the world tells you when you're to meditate in these cults, they tell you to empty your mind. But when God tells you about meditating, He tells you specifically to meditate on the Word, which is not empty. So you have to be careful listening to what the world says. They'll take a spiritual principle and twist it and pervert it and take you in the wrong direction. We got enough empty heads. We need to be meditating on the Word. Say it with me. Meditate on the Word. If I'm meditating, and by the way, how much do I need to? I'll just tell you God set the standard. He said day and night. By the way, He said it more than once. If He said it more than once, you ought to take heed to that. But when He says it twice, because see, the Bible and the Scripture said in the New Testament, every promise be established by the mouth of two or three witnesses. So when He says it twice, that means doubly, you ought to pay attention. He told this man how to keep his healing. He said, sin no more. Otherwise, you go back and read Matthew chapter 12. What happened? That demonic spirit came back, and he saw the house was empty. It was clean. It was nice and garnished and everything well prepped, but it's empty. Notice God wants you to be filled with the Word and filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 3.19 and Ephesians 4.13 says, God wants us to walk in the fullness of God. Say it with me, fullness of God. Why does he want us to be in the fullness of God? <laughs> Don't give any room for the, en the enemy. You have a scripture for that? Yeah. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27. That's New Testament. It says, give no place to the devil. Now, he's not coming in our spirit, but he can get in your head, and he can get in your body. Now, you have the authority to kick him out if you know to resist him and know how to do that and speak the word of God over that situation. Close your Bibles and stand up. Hallelujah. But he said a worse thing. By the way, that evil spirit. And by the way, all evil spirits are evil. It means they've come to bring evil. The Bible says he went and he got seven more wicked spirits. And more spirits that were more wicked than him. And they came back into that house. And that man was worse than before. Sin has a price tag. Sin is not going to make you better. It's going to make you worse. Hallelujah. Let's just go ahead and lift up our hands toward heaven. Father. We just thank you for today. Thank you, Father God, for getting us here today safely. Thank you, Lord, as we go home today, Father. Lord, we're going to look up these things. How many times Jesus, our heavenly, our heavenly Lord and Savior, how many times he told people to do the impossible that they couldn't do? And as they responded and acted in faith in what he said, Lord, Lord, they arose and they became healed. And, Father, we know that sin can give place. So, Father, we're determined to shut the door. When temptations come, they are going to come. 
but we're going to say no to temptation. Say this with me. I will say no to temptation. I'm determined this next year to be a temple, to be a vessel, a vessel of honor, a vessel called, a vessel sanctified for the purposes of God. It's not my purposes. It's not my will. It's not my plan. It's His purposes. It's His plan. It's His will. Use me, Lord. I dedicate myself to you, my whole spirit, my whole soul, my whole body to your plans that everything that I would say, everything I would do would bring you glory, would bring you honor, and when temptations come, and they will come, I will say with my mouth, no, I'm not going to do that. That's not my nature. I am dead to sin, but I'm alive unto the righteousness of God. Thank you, Father. I call myself a man of God. I call myself a woman of God. And Father, I give you all the praise, all the glory. Thank you, Father. If there are things that I'm doing that it's just the appearance of evil, I'm open to you showing me because I don't want to be a stumbling block. I want to be a stepping stone to help other believers and those that haven't accepted you to come to your Son, our Savior, and be born again. Thank you, Father, for everything you have done, everything you are doing, everything you will be doing. Thank you, Father. This is going to be a good year, a good year of prosperity, a good year of abundance, and I'll give you all the praise. I'll give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen. Turn around and tell somebody, don't you forget, God is good to you and I. How often? All the time. Then look at him and say, and go today and sin no more. See you Wednesday night.